Today we're going to get a full picture of the personality of Jesus. It has to do with wine and whips. We see his beautiful compassion and his frightening intensity. It helps us to understand who Jesus is. Don't put Jesus in a box. Hey, I'm John. Welcome to Crossroads. Be more like John. Not, not a fry cook, John from the Bible. He, he wrote multiple books of the Bible. I did? And it, it says that he was loved by Jesus. Sure he does, kid. Be more like John. I wound up here in America and I just decided I better pick up a job, you know? A guy has to have something to tithe on. Believe it or not, he knows a lot about Jesus. Today, we're gonna hear how John and Jesus, they weren't that different from us, except for one like small difference. Jesus was God and man at the same exact time. So this one time we were at this wedding in Cana. A couple didn't make it, no big deal. Everybody and their mom was there, even his. The party was starting to die down because everyone ran out of wine. And Jesus' mom came to him and said, hey, do something. And Jesus was like, mom, not in front of my friends. So what he did end up doing was he took this water and he turned it into some great top shelf wine. And we're not talking barefoot, even though we all were. And then the party kept going and we had a blast. Right after that, we all went down to the temple and there was a different kind of party going on. And this one, Jesus was not about. Uh, so we actually like made a whip and drove those people out of there like they were a herd of cattle. It was crazy. Jesus' best friend, no big deal. Pretty cool. Hey, welcome to Crossroads. My name is Brian. We're in a series about Jesus through the eyeballs of his alleged best friend. John thought he was his best friend. He was known as the beloved. So we'll just go with that. And we're looking at the things that he saw out of his friend Jesus and what we can learn from it today. We don't really know everything there is to know about Jesus. There's only like four books in the Bible that contain his teachings. And of those four, they're not even containing all of his teachings and all of his miracles. In the book of John chapter 20, verse 30, it says this. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So there's amazing things that weren't even included in here, and yet what is in here is amazing. You know, the best way to get to know someone is through the lens of people who are closest to them. That would include the Apostle John. Lots of people have a cultural touch point for Jesus, but, but few people knew what he was really, really like. You know what someone's like based on the artwork. You know, if you've ever had little kids who've drawn your picture, you know that your kids think that you're really, really ugly because every parent's picture looks really, really ugly. When we see a picture of something, we have an image of who that person is. And I'll tell you what's really scary. What's really scary is to see the pictures of who Jesus was that have been depicted over the years. Really weird, weird. like I'll just, here's one. I'll just call this Spooky Jesus. I mean, look at Spooky Jesus here. It just, it just freaks you out, man. You ought to be in a haunted house. Is that really who Jesus is? Or maybe there's a veterinarian Jesus. That's one of my favorite. Jesus sitting there just petting lambs. There's, there's nothing in the Bible that says he ever picked up a lamb, let alone petted a lamb, but just makes us feel good. I like it. Or there's manly man Jesus. <laughs> these things, these things are really so unrealistic. The Old Testament prophesying about Jesus coming says there's nothing about his form that would draw us to him. Jesus, in terms of his looks, was just average. He was not ripped. That's too manly for you. How about this one? Girly man Jesus. <laughs> Poor Jesus. I don't know if Jesus likes these pictures of him or not, but I think they're kind of funny. Or Prozac Jesus. 
Jesus just looks kind of depressed and always down on himself. And of course, today we have fewer and fewer of us who want to acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior. So we'd rather have homeboy Jesus. He's just my buddy, like, hey, hey, hey. The truth is there's elements of truth probably in all of these pictures, but we need the whole Bible to understand all of God. And we need the whole book of John to understand all of God. I'm gonna give you today two stories that are polar opposite extremes of seeing Jesus. It's like, it's like as extreme as manly man Jesus and girly man Jesus. You're like, wait a minute, is, is this the same guy? Oftentimes, when we see the extremes of somebody, we understand the totality of who they are. These extremes of Jesus are back to back in the book of John. The first one is not unlike where I am right now. It's a wedding at Cana. Jesus is there to support the bride and the groom. And there is an issue that takes place at the wedding reception, which would have been a multi-day affair. This issue happens that's going to be a great embarrassment to a lot of people. So his mother, Mary, goes to Jesus and asks for help. Let's just read what happens in John chapter 2, verse 1 and following. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. One of the more humorous things of Jesus talks to his mother, Mother Mary, and just says, woman, woman. Now some translations take off the edge and they'll say, dear woman, there's no dear in there. He just refers to his mom's like, Woman, what, what, what are you trying to do to me? He's not being disrespectful of Mary, but he's definitely trying to exert a bit of his authority and telling Mary that she's overstepping her bounds and she's trying to call in a favor that is kind of pushing his hand in a way in which he doesn't want to push his hand. Now, Mary has been with Jesus for about 30 years. She's seen amazing things that Jesus has done. We don't know what miracles, but probably there's been some miracles that have taken place. And Mary's basically asking Jesus to do something right now. Asking Jesus, maybe not to make a Kroger run, but asking him to make some wine. And Jesus gives her a bit of a harsh rebuke. Woman, this is, this is just not the time for me. Now, Mary's heart is in the right place. Jesus and all the disciples are in a place where people are getting embarrassed. This is a matter of honor. This is a matter of shame for them. To run out of wine at your wedding would have been really embarrassing. It would have been embarrassing to the bride and the groom. It would have been embarrassing to the keeper of the ceremonies, the master of the ceremonies or the wine steward because he didn't plan well enough. It would have been embarrassing to the, to the people who were showing up for the, for the wedding, because now they're not sure, should they drink? Should they not drink? All of this is happening in the background, and Mary is asking Jesus to intercede and take away the shame. The cultural obligations are such that when you have a wedding, you have enough wine, and there's not enough wine. Jesus does a carefully considered and calculated move. Actually, this story, the next one I'm gonna share with you, there's two carefully considered and calculated moves that he makes. This time, he's going to alleviate the shame for everyone, and he's going to try to increase joy for everyone. You know, here at Crossroads, we wanna increase joy for everyone as well, especially during the season for all of our educators. That's why we have our Thank Our Educators initiative right now. Educators have just been through a grinder the last several years with masks and teaching kids with masks and not having the support they need and having to buy their own supplies inside of classes and feeling alone and, and having parents, by the way, not happy with you and not happy with the school, not happy with the principal. I don't know if you recognize it or not, but just about everybody in America has been unhappy and people who have a position of leadership are bearing the brunt of that unhappiness all the time. Over the past two years of the pandemic, 
more than half of all educators have considered quitting their jobs. Yet they've responded to these challenging times in many courageous ways. And despite uncertainty, exhaustion, and discouragement, they've continued to provide safe and encouraging learning environments for their students, impacting the lives of thousands in the next generation. We see you. We applaud you. We are grateful for you. Join us this spring when for one week we'll pack ourselves a brown bag lunch every day and give the money we save from not eating out straight to hardworking educators. That same week we'll be using an app designed to guide us on an epic adventure to encourage all the hardworking people continuing to serve in our schools. Along with packing our lunches, we'll be doing other fun and practical activities to surprise and delight our educators. Go to crossroads.net slash educators for more info. This is why you. And teachers aren't paid enough to bear the brunt of unhappy parents and unhappy community members, but we care about them. And I know everybody cares about educators, even who gives them a hard time. That's why we want to bless them to thank our educators. I'm going to be packing a lunch for a whole week and looking forward to blessing educators who I know in, our, in my community. I, I hope you are as well. This heart comes from Jesus, who wants to bless people. And he sees this wedding going awry, and he wants to make it right. His mother, I think she wants him to showcase his miraculous power, bring Jesus, if you will, out of his savior closet so people see him. I think Jesus just wants to alleviate the pain, the stress, the shame, that are there. Mary assumes that he's going to go along with this plan and do something. So the story continues in verse 5. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And so they took it. Jesus looks around, he works with whatever he's got at hand. And what he's got are these huge ceremonial vats of water. Ceremonial vats of water would have been meant for religious cleansing, religious purifying. Uh, we cleanse ourselves physically before a meal. The Jews would do that as well, but they also believed in cleansing themselves spiritually. If they had animal product on them, or if they had touched things they shouldn't have touched, or done things they shouldn't have done, they have to ritually clean themselves with the water that are in these pots, have it go over them, and symbolically, my uncleanness spiritually is leaving me. Jesus takes something that is meant for holy purposes to bless and enable the party to keep going on takes the water, takes the water and he fills the water. He takes the water and he hands it to the wine steward, the masters of the ceremony and says, just take it to the table. They're thinking, uh, okay. They take it to the table and watch what happens. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, that the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called to the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory as his disciples believed in him. Now, I got to tell you right now, the Penelope pure hearts, the Dudley do rights, the hyper religious amongst us really don't like this story at all. They would prefer a dry wedding. Nothing stronger than, than Diet Coke. So when I went to seminary, I learned things like, well, this wasn't actually real wine. 
This was a, a great mash that hadn't yet been fermented. That's exactly what someone has to say who's against fun receptions. That's exactly what someone has to say who can't believe that Jesus would do a miracle to keep the party going. It's exactly what he do, does. How do I know this is alcoholic wine? Because you can taste the difference between alcoholic wine and non-alcoholic wine. By the way, just public service announcement, you can have a good time with alcohol. It really can happen. You can, have, and public service announcement, there's a lot of people who follow their conviction and don't have wine at weddings, and God is very happy about that, okay? But let's just look at what happened to this wedding. When Jesus goes into the water, he pulls out wine. Ooh. That's some high quality H2O. That's what I call high quality H2O. Oh! <laughs> uh, pours out wine. How do we know it's wine? and not non-alcoholic wine. We know by what the wine steward says. The wine steward, the master of the ceremonies, who knows what wine is, he tastes it, and he knows the difference between non-alcoholic wine and alcoholic wine. So do you. Oh, everyone knows that difference. And that's even today when non-alcoholic wine has gotten much, much better than it was. And he says, wow, this is amazing. Normally when people are a bit looped, they bring out the cheap stuff and they can't tell whether or not it's Riuniti Red. So you don't know what Riuniti Red is. That's like the old school cheap wine. I took it to my high school prom. And by the way, my parents busted me and I got kicked out of my prom. That's another story for another day. This isn't like the, the Riuniti Red. This isn't the, the two buck chuck for the next generation. This isn't the barefoot wine for the most recent generation. This is high quality, great wine. If Jesus is gonna make wine, it's gonna be great wine. And the wine steward verifies, this is amazing. Jesus enabled this party to happen because he had feelings. You ever thought about that? Jesus felt, he empathized for these people and he wanted to help them from being publicly embarrassed. Not only that, he might have also had feelings that made him want to have more wine himself. He had the feelings of maybe wanting to have a better time for himself. Again, mind-blowing for many of us if all we know is Prozac Jesus, but he had legitimate feelings across the entire spectrum. And before you categorize him as just a party animal who tries to keep people from feeling bad and keep the good times going, wedged right up against that is another story that's on the other side of the emotional spectrum. Hey, where you been? Oh, hey, sorry, I just uh, just got off work. Why did you get a job? Oh, I just, uh, I needed something to tithe on, you know? Oh, great, you wanna talk to us about giving? Oh, that's a just great- Just like the theology behind it, maybe. Oh, great just question. quick. Yeah, 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 so in the beginning, uh, when God created the heavens and the earth, he created all that was in and of the earth, and th that substance, that is what we draw from. Six and a half hours later, and that is the reason that I like to give. Okay, well, uh, good. Just wanted to say that only around 10% of people watching this give to Crossroads. What? And that's 10? A tithe of people? Yeah, that's a, it, it's okay, it's something to upset you, it's something to upset anybody watching. I just want you to know that Crossroads is donor funded and everything you give, it helps. It helps spread this message to even more people. Okay. That's all. Okay, I like that, I yeah. like that. And I just learned this, that that thing on your phone you this can actually thing. give from there. Like, yeah. how do you shekels even get in there? It's it, crazy. I, I'll explain it later. But if you're watching on your phone, all you gotta do is click the give button right, right there. It's super, super easy. I love that. Yeah. So next week, there's actually this thing called Easter, which yeah. is not what they called it in my day. What did they call it? Uh, just like the day my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ rose from the grave and came back. Um, it's a lot of words. You can actually read all about it in, in my book. Or you can watch the movie. We actually made a whole thing about it. It's gonna be amazing. It's next week. Yeah, just check this out. Wow, just like Harry Potter. Easter is a love story. Love has come to save us all. Join us for Easter with Crossroads. Find service times at crossroads.net slash Easter.
Jesus isn't just party guy, he's also rebuke guy. In fact, there's a bit of a whiplash going from the table where the reception was to the next table that we're going to look at. It was the table that was at the temple where Jesus went to in Jerusalem to connect with God. He actually ends up whipping people. Yeah, that's why I said whiplash. Wait, wine? Whips? What, what, what is going on here? Well, let's read the story to find out. John chapter 2, verse 13. The pastor of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. He goes to the temple in Jerusalem. He's been there before. He knows what to see. He's not surprised by much, except the temple started here in terms of money making and they went like to here. There was always a, a table that was in what's known as the court of the Gentiles outside of the proper part of the temple itself. And this table was meant to serve people in worship. Some people would come from long, long distances away and they'd be driving cattle or bringing pigeons or some such thing to offer sacrifices in the temple. And it was just a pain. So some of them would actually buy something that was right there. Or you came from a foreign land where there was a foreign currency and you wanted to trade your currency, change your money into the currency of, of the Jews. This was so you could bring your currency from where you were, trade it in for the Jews' currency and, and make an offering inside of worship like you would like to do. But it's gone to a whole new level. It's not just there to enable people to worship. People are now making this a capitalistic endeavor. It's okay to be a capitalist. But being a capitalist by selling spirituality to ingratiate yourself with the almighty dollar is an entirely different thing. It says that Jesus takes a bunch of cords and fashions a whip about them. This is really important to see. This isn't like Indiana Jones taking a leather whip and whipping people. This is a very intentional, thought out decision to think through what he's going to do. I can just see Jesus praying while he does this. Lord, help me to do the right thing. Telling himself, don't overreact. Let's get this one right. And he's, once he, it, I mean, it'll take a while to braid a whip out of cords. Once he does do this, we find that he instigates conflict. He not just keeps the party going, but Jesus instigates the conflict. And he takes, he takes his, his whip and he just, he starts flailing it around, just flailing around. Is he hitting people? I don't know. If he is hitting people, it doesn't hurt because he's fashionate. It's not a, it's not a leather whip like people are getting welts, but he's flailing it around, exhibiting massive levels of anger. I don't think they have necessarily an abacus and jewelry, but they got stuff there where they're making money. And they're making money to make money. They're not just making money while they serve people in their worship. Their point, these religious leaders, is to make money. Jesus comes up in a willful, calculated move, and he just storms in and he... and people scatter. I mean, what is going on? I, I don't know if he's still doing this or not, but he, he is clearly upset because he's willing to stand up to corruption. He's confrontational when he needs to be. He's comforting when he needs to be, and he's confrontational when he needs to be. By the way, this is one of the reasons why if you ever can get to a crossroads building, you'll find that we never have a bookstore or a resource center inside any of our buildings. 
at least not on Sunday morning, because we don't want to get close to ticking Jesus off. And he gets ticked off when people are trying to make money off of people who are coming there to worship. That's why we downplay money a lot. It's because we don't want anyone to get confused that we're not here to make money. We're here to help you connect with God. The temple was a spot where heaven and earth came together. And it should have been a holy place. And instead, it was a place of profiteering. If you want to make Jesus mad, start using his name to make money for yourself. And so, yes, Jesus is very mad at certain pockets of religiosity that are in our country and in our world. He's not opposed to the temple sellers offering a service. He's opposed to their economic motivations and them fleecing the flock and padding their own pockets. One moment he's turning water into wine, the next moment he's taking whips and overturning tables. One moment there's a table at a reception where there's festive laughs, and the next moment there's a table on the ground with doves and birds and squawking and people running all over the place. He wasn't just doing the right thing. He was also fulfilling prophecies in the Old Testament that John knew about and pointed people to, that he would have a zeal for his house. How about you? Do you have a zeal for the house of God or do you just kind of come around the house of God whenever everything is convenient in your schedule? Do you have a zeal for the church, for the local church? Or do you have a zeal for your boat? Does the zeal for your boat or for your new house, does it come anywhere close to your zeal for the church, for the local church. Jesus got very upset with people who wanted the trappings of capitalism more than they wanted to be trapped by the heart of God in worship. That's why this is known as the cleansing of the temple. He cleaned it to get people to have a clean heart before God. Now, what do both of these stories tell us about Jesus? And what does they tell us about what he was it like? It tells us that at a wedding, he can change the molecules from water to wine. And in the temple, Jesus can do the same thing in cleansing the temple because he can cleanse our life. First, he changes hearts, and then he begins to help us to change the things that are outside of our life. We consume the wine, it goes inside of us, but then there's things on the outside of us that we need to also change. We have to also be real clearly here. <laughs> Just because Jesus got ticked off doesn't mean you could get, get to be ticked off while you're driving. This is a very rare mode of righteous anger for Jesus. It's not the kind of rage that we know. We're, we're always angry, seemingly. We're angry when we drive. Shoot, I saw a video of somebody just several weeks ago was actually firing a gun out of their car because somebody threw a water bottle against their car road rage of people punching people because they cut in line, or <laughs> line rage it might be, or the rage that we see on social media of just shaming people on social media where Jesus alleviates shame at the, the wedding feast. We pile on shame. We want to shame people to have the values we want and to be inside of our own little political bubble. What Jesus had is nothing like the out of control emotionalism that we have today. Every once in a while, and I do mean every once in a while, like this for Jesus, this is like a one time it's recorded thing. Every once in a while, there's an issue of justice that has to take place. By the way, if you're really into justice and social justice, if you're perpetually mad, you got a major problem because Jesus was not perpetually mad. You get angry, he was not perpetually mad. This is a calculated move to make a statement. And he lives in an unafraid way, confident that his father loves him, confident that he needs to do and say the right thing, whether that's filling up the wine and filling people up with joy, or overturning the tables and filling people up with conviction over the negative ways they're pretending like they're following God. What's Jesus doing for you? He's setting a table for you right now. He's setting a table for you and he's putting a cup in your life and he wants your cup in your life to overflow with goodness and joy, just like it happened with the cups at the wedding feast. 
And he's also calling you and I to overturn the things in our life that are out of alignment with his will. And we see his beautiful compassion and his frightening intensity. It helps us to understand who Jesus is. Don't put Jesus in a box. Don't make him your party guy. Don't make him your anger guy. These extreme aspects of his personality come together to form the full bandwidth of who he is. He is great. He wants you to give him your life. Let me pray for you right now. God, I'm thankful for a God that is beyond my imagination and beyond what anything I could create in and of my own creative abilities. Your, your stories, your word stupefies me. It stuns me. It makes me fall in love with God, fall in love with Jesus in new and abounding ways. Many of us, God, for the first time, we want to receive you. We want to fee receive the Lord of the whip and the Lord of the wine. We want both of those. We want you in our life. Jesus, would you come into my life right now? Forgive me. Overturn my tables, and I choose to follow you the rest of my life. Amen. Hey, I hope your heart's right. This would be a great opportunity for us to worship God inside the temple of wherever you are right now. Let's sing this together to him. Hey, if you like that song, there's actually a lot more music just like it. Just go to Spotify, Apple Music, and search for Crossroads Music. So you, you can listen to music on an Apple? Not exactly. Um, also though, we're doing a thing called the Bible Challenge, reading your book as a community, this whole yeah. entire series, the book of John. And we put this together for you. It's a free guidebook that tells you some of the history, some of the context around what you're reading. It's free. Go to crossroads.net slash Bible Challenge. We'll mail one to your house. Yeah. How about that? I don't know why you need that. I thought it did pretty good, but uh, I know we've been talking a lot about how like Jesus was my friend because he's my best friend. and. Um, <laughs> 
we actually had like 12 friends, um, more like 11. But uh, here at Crossroads, we actually have a lot of friends. Uh huh. We do. We have a lot of friends, and they are changing the world, like our friend Jack in Japan. Check out his story. Hey, I'm Jack from Kagoshima, Japan. I want to thank all of our givers at Crossroads for supporting the work that we do here. Because of you, we were able to stay connected in community while growing our home church here in a nation with less than 1% Christ followers. Crossroads tools, resources, and most importantly, you enable us to lead our home church, to run after our friends, and to serve our city, Kagoshima. Domo arigatou gozaimasu. You didn't see that coming, did you? You ever been in a bar fight? Me neither. And in fact, this isn't even about bar fights. This isn't even about bars. This is about Jesus showing up in the most unexpected places. Yeah. That, was amazing. that look good? 